When it comes to what I'd call modern classics in gaming, we have plenty of choices from the recently released Baldur's Gate 3, Fear and Hunger, Elden Ring, or Genshin, <laughs> Genshin Impact. But more often than not, when thinking about quality developers, one usually comes to mind. From Software, a company that has delivered a very large library of loved and adored games, many you likely know or have played. Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, Elden Ring, Bloodborne Cart, and my longtime favorite, their very own mecha series, Armored Core. We, we don't talk about the other one, or this one, oh. especially this one. Oh my god, I'm trying to fall back! Complete chaos! I can't fucking control this thing under pressure of any amount of fucking pressure, Mech technology dude. has an amazing ability I to mean, analyze body movement even better I can't than fucking enough. move my head, dude. The connect is... Oh, seal of approval. Now, I love Armor Core mainly because I'm personally a giant mecha fan and have been one since I was a kid, with it being one of the franchises that I grew up playing, which led into me getting into Dark Souls when I was younger and depressed in high school and middle school, leading to me kind of forgetting one of From Software's best series ever. That was until recently when AC6 made its bombastic comeback bringing new life into mecha, the community and the series. A series I've been revisiting recently with me playing through Armor Core 4 and 4 Answer for fun, and a video which, besides shameless plugging, I'd actually recommend checking out because some context is required, but not as central for what we're looking at today. The often forgotten and hated Generation 5 of Armor Core that contains the loathed Armor Core 5 and the actually quite good Armor Core Verdict Day. Games that were, as many described to be awful, oh scaled back, God. unplayable, oh, broken, oh, terrible, man. too slow, and bland. Something you never hear about from software games. So I just gotta know, what went wrong with this once and again beloved series to give it such a reputation? First, we gotta go back a little to put this game in context. This will be the third time I've done an Armor Core background, so I'm not gonna go super in-depth this time and just give a little quick overview of what's important just in case anyone thinks I'm missing anything, it's on purpose. Armor Core has generations that all for the most part have been their own timelines, with Gen 1 being Armor Core 1 to Master of Arena. These games had a focus on relatively tight gameplay with very little space that was usually maze-like in its design. Armor Core customization yeah, garage, was also still a highlight is, uh, here with plenty of ways here. to make them your own, with combat itself Hills, being more focused on know. grounded, slow, semi-tactical combat. Armor Core themselves in combat, piloted by Ravens, weren't even common, usually only used for boss encounters, instead fielding most fights with generic fodder. The soundtracks were also a techno-cyberpunkish opposed to the orchestral tracks we get a lot of nowadays. Gen 2 had two games, and just focused on improving the gameplay loop of Gen 1. 
getting into the Gen 3 with a few more wow. Gen 3 games was essentially just Armored Core classic gameplay refined to an almost perfection after all the years of work. There were more customization and gameplay options while the games took a bit of a more tactical approach making the latter games in the generation much harder than most of what came before. Admittedly, the jank from these previous generations is what's still around for most of these games, even with the improvements they made. But this is a combination of two issues. There were a ton of controls, the which today this? doesn't look like a lot, but then you remember these awful tiny controllers. I'll make this bit again, but just look how small these things are nowadays. So it's no surprise there's gonna be issues. This led into the loved Generation 4, which had Armored Core 4 and 4 yeah, Answer. This generation there. decided to soft reboot the franchise by reworking everything from the ground up. It was now no longer a relatively slow tactical shooter, but now a stupidly so fast quick. power fantasy focused on putting face. power into the player's hands and making you feel like you're a towering machine of destruction in your Armored Core. With encounters where you soar through battlefields at breakneck speeds and tear through enemies with your deadly arsenal with little to no trouble unless it was a fellowed armor core or giant arms fort. Controls were also streamlined to make controlling this updated gameplay way more comfortable for the players with the full suite of weapons and it worked. A lot of people including myself find this to be my favorite generation. With just a few downsides. Namely, Graphically not great, with a lot of the world being kind of barren and while the multiplayer was good, it wasn't the main focus. Instead, it focused on developing an amazing plot about humanity surviving in a dying world ruled by corporations who have plans to secretly direct the world order in their own favor, while another secret organization plots to take them down. Admittedly, yeah, it's we kind of a common plot point nowadays, but it's still really good here. This was the generation that made me love AC personally, and I'm not the only one. The gameplay, the art, and the story were just amazing, and I loved everything AC had become to this point. So I wanted to see where the story of Armor Core 4 Answer would go in Generation 5, as 4 ended up being an incredibly memorable experience, despite it looking very much like an early PS3 and Xbox 360 game. Yes, this time I remembered it came out on Xbox. Generation 5, the generation before Armor Core 6, I passed math by the way, decided to confront some of these issues at the tail end of the 7th generation of consoles, while returning to form and losing a certain swamp enjoyer as their director who instead went to work on a small series known as Dark Souls. Firstly, we'll be talking about Armor Core 5, since it's the first in this generation and important to understand what direction this generation took to get to the far, far better game I'd actually recommend, Armored Core Verdict Day, since both are basically the same with very little differences and how FromSoft managed to make one of the most hated games in a franchise. When first starting both games, you are greeted by this boot up screen that immediately tells you this is something different. Good morning, main system, checking pilot data. Where previous games, and even the new ones, have menus with themes that are very energetic, ethereal, or melancholic, this game's menu is very militaristic, broody, dark, weary, yet still very beautiful. This focus on war is embodied by just being on the main menu, with you not looking at the world from a mission board, but from a focused war map of a relatively small area you'll be fighting for. You can use the triggers to switch menus between the now customizable garage, which might actually have my favorite theme out of all of them. And your team, which is the multiplayer feature that let you group up into a well team that plays together and level up over time, opening up new stuff in the shop. You could, in theory, just join an old team, or if you're emulating, getting a changed file to max the team immediately and have maxed out shop options. 
but you would never cheat in a video game. I, I thought about it though. One thing you guys will also notice is this giant like wall this. of grayed out things. This is, this is because two reasons. This is awful One is I'm on an emulator and getting multiplayer to work on those can take a dark ritual sometimes. Hell, even just getting this game to work took a bit of effort since it's broken on most emulators outside of a very specific build of Xenia that still crashes a lot. Wait, hmm. But now that's funny. If the game is crashing, is it better to play slower or to speed run it? <laughs> In one hand, you get through the game faster. On the other, you're probably increasing your chances of crashing. No, 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 it crashed. Fuck. No. <laughs> Oh, life is pain. And the other reason is that Armor's Core 5 servers are actually down. Meaning for once, I'll actually skip most of that content since it's genuinely inaccessible to pretty much everybody. Verdict Day, on the other hand, is still up, so we will get to that when we get to Verdict Day. For now, all you need to know is there was co-op, multiplayer team fights, the team system, and quite awfully, the online shop, because those have never caused issues in games, ever. Here, it's a store that lets players make weapons and tune them to be very specific, and mostly just stronger, making them flat out better than base weaponry, making multiplayer kind of awful for new players who didn't have or couldn't afford the rarer, just flat out better stuff, making fights unbalanced and leaving us nowadays with just the single player experience. Which leads us to the most polarizing part of Generation 5, the gameplay and story. Armored Core 5 takes place many, many, many years after Armored Core for Answer, being the only storyline to be cross-gen. The world, after being destroyed by the Kojima particles left after the many corporate conflicts, has fallen to an even more desolated state than before, with very little pockets of life left, and even technology and essential knowledge being lost. It's almost like the Age of Strife in Warhammer, just minus an emperor to save humanity. Sorry, I had to throw at least one 40k reference in a video. We are a mercenary called the Dark Raven, who belongs to the Resistance fighting to survive against a tyrannical regime, led by someone known as the Father, in one of the only habitable and civilized cities that's left and free of contamination, Alloy Gate City. A city that not only sounds like an early PS3 game, but also shows you when you first arrive that armor cores aren't what they used to be. ACs have been reduced to these piles of salvaged and thrown together pieces of junk, not even comparable to last generation's necks, where necks were fast, agile, tanky, large, and imposing with their towering frames. The current generations of ACs are small and hunched over, considerably less arm, slow, vulnerable, and considerably less developed, just kind of thrown together with whatever parts they could salvage. You are more like one of the normals you destroyed, often as cannon fodder. And just like normals, you don't have a lot of variety, with one of the least varied shops in the franchise. Most weapon types for arms are still here with a few new options like howitzers, machine guns, energy machine guns, and new extremely heavy weapons that require you to brace yourself before firing if you don't have a tank or tetrapod legs. Back weapons are also completely gone. Instead, you are required to carry extra weapons that you can switch between freely, and personally, I hate this decision. It removed all of the different types of weapons that used to be on your back, with missiles just being in your shoulders, of which you can only have one type. This obviously leads to builds also being very, very limited, with not a whole lot of difference between what I found. You even lost out on a lot of the cool animations that back weapons used to have, like the giant missile pods or giant cannons, and from a subjective point of view, it just isn't armored core looking to me. When I think of an armored core, the silhouette has always been something on its back, whether it's missiles or a giant cannon, and it just isn't that. The only real changes I loved about 5 was the kick, where you can dash into enemies and just falcon kick the hell out of them, which does really, really good damage, and is kind of funny when it does or doesn't work out, like when I tried to punch a tank. You know what? I, you know what? I, I want to punch this tank. Let's go punch this tank. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> Look at that damage! Oh my god! There's also something new called ultimate weapons that are one-time use and obliterate a target when they're used. They're all unique and have this really cool effect where you blow your own arm off to use them and then your screen gets all disrupted to unleash this crazy, powerful, almost forbidden feeling weapon on your enemies. But you 
get them by beating the game, meaning you'll get them absurdly late. Or, if you played it when it came out, by pre-ordering, which is super lame and means you likely won't ever get to use them nowadays. In actual gameplay, this means you're required to play completely differently. There's no longer vertical gameplay like For Answer with you being tied mostly to the ground where you're very slow. This is due to the energy systems rework where you spend energy like normal dashing, boosting, flying, or using energy weapons. But with the one key difference, the energy regeneration is massively reduced when in combat mode, making it very difficult to have enough energy for most fights outside of very specific builds. The energy even makes energy weapons, in my opinion, useless, as they take way too much energy to actually use them, leaving you almost for dead at times. The way you get energy back faster is by going into scan mode, which disarms you and allows you to, well, uh, scan things. Namely, enemies you tag with the new tracker darts or close enemies you can get through walls. You want to be in this mode as much as possible to keep your energy economy healthy, as it's now a gauge you have to actively keep track of and engage with, as being caught with it down will often get you just killed. These changes led to you having to use the buildings and the actually really good looking environments for cover. As you are so weak now, even the average enemy stands a chance at taking a chunk out of your health or even just shooting you down. A bit of a side note, but I do like the way you die, boy. Instead of the weird like Neil or ACs just stop moving for previous games and even the new one, this one has impact as AC start to tumble and fall apart in the direction they were going. It's a small but really nice change I actually quite like and would like to see back. A change that you'll unfortunately probably see a lot as enemies are incredibly strong and are a genuine threat with their high damage, health, numbers, and sometimes mobility. Enemy types consist of a honestly really small variety where I felt I kind of solved every enemy by the second or third mission. There are tanks, gun emplacements, snipers, somewhat advanced drones, and these awful machine gun guys that do tons of damage and even some have shields making them even more difficult to kill. You have to essentially use the kick on them to even get a chance at killing them. I, I hated these the most and I, I might actually have PTSD from these now. <laughs> They also now have rock, paper, scissors armor system where each enemy is weak to a specific type of damage, such as kinetic, thermal, or chemical. Damaging with an ineffective weapon type does reduce damage. It's still possible to kill the enemy, but often feels like you're shooting an airsoft gun in a car window. L like, yeah, you'll, you'll get through it eventually, but it's a process. Don't care, don't care, don't care, still don't care, I don't care, I don't. The system is really, really bad as it's not only not fun to engage with, but also limits the type of weapons even more if you want to deal full damage. I'm actually shocked they committed to this so hard since it just doesn't work in this type of game. Like yeah, in Fire Emblem, Xenoblade, Final Fantasy, or Triangle Strategy, it works because those are turn-based games where you can save scum or push through with items or something. But here in an action game, it just doesn't feel good to see that ineffective ping over and over and over and watch your bullets ricochet off, which slows down the already slow gameplay even more. Given our new status and how we have to fight now, the environments and levels are key to making this game feel like all of this works. And it does and doesn't manage to do this. I actually found that given how the game has been reworked this way, a heavyweight tank, which is something I usually don't enjoy tends to absolutely tear through this game with little to no opposition, often enabling you to just stand still on some boss fights. But let's actually stop talking about the bad and let's do something which many people don't actually do when referring to Gen 5. Uh, let's talk about the good. The maps are really good looking with a very solid variety of stages considering where we are which is in just one big city. You still have snowy mountains, deserts, industrial areas such as ports or factories, and even the city itself has different sections of it making it feel different such as the tunnels, the downtown, the outskirts, or the residential areas. Texture work in all of this is great across the board, with the art design really shining, making this game feel really grungy, and it delivers the idea of you being in a war on a desolated planet really, really well. The UI while playing the game is also quite nice and one of my favorite, with the central information being right where you need it. 
without having to look all over the screen just for ammo or health, it's just all right there. Although in scan mode, when scanning enemies, it can be a lot to look at at times. What is that? What the fuck is that? I also like how, depending on the weather condition, your screen can get foggy or covered in rain droplets like you're right in the pilot seat. I just do wish there was a system like Metro Exodus where you could just wipe your screen off. The sound design likewise is really great too, with most things you're actually sounding the best they ever had to this point. You yourself sound as heavy as you are with giant footsteps, the booster is roaring as you soar across battlefields and your weapons being nice and chunky. Locate the helicopter and destroy it. Speaking of which, this game has some of the best sounding weapons at this point once again in the franchise, with laser weapons sounding fantastic, ballistics sounding heavy, and when you kick an enemy there's this nice crunch of metal crushing metal. Although the one thing I actually hated was because you swap from combat mode to scan mode so much. System. Scan mode. System. Scan mode. System. Scan mode. This voice line is burned into my mind, and if I hear it again, I, I, I will actually snap. <laughs> it is giving me the same vibe as the shops from Bioshock. It, it, is, it is burned into my head. The OST is once again fantastic with some really intense music, and one of the best songs in the franchise just feels completely overlooked. because it's attached to Gen 5, but I digress. Voice acting also follows the sound direction of being really good, with no one doing an actually bad job. Everyone is just good here and delivers the characters well, with no standouts like Fragile in 4 Answer, or Amazig from 4 who I still don't really understand what he was saying. Dory, come in. Where is the chief? I thought he was supposed to be leaving the support units. Sorry, Captain. We're a little absent-minded. He's the best. A Father hates to be disappointed, Dory. We must not betray his expectations. We are the corporation. We get the job done. You don't have anything to worry about, sir. See that I don't. What a pleasure it is to hear your voice, Cordelia. But I guess it's rosary now, isn't it? Oh, Regan. Still alive, huh? never wore your strong suit. Is that any way to talk to your older sister? Especially after I went to the trouble of asking your old friends what comm channel you use. Tell me what you want. I've come to kill you, of course. The only parts that are actually bad in this game aren't their faults and are always writing related, and we will get to that very soon in the story section. Unfortunately, we now have to get to the bad and the really bad, which sadly are tied together. Starting with the really bad is the really, really weird mission structure of the game. This game's missions are divided into two main things. Story missions, which are unsurprisingly story-based and important, and order missions, which are just jobs you get that usually break down into either clear out these enemies or kill this AC, as the arena is also gone here with AC fights being put into order missions. A quick sad note about both of these types is that they removed the briefing, which is super lame to me as the pre-mission briefing is one of the most iconic parts of the franchise to me and takes away a little world building that was done with them, since they give you a glimpse into each faction's inner workings and the people when they hired you. These missions also have hidden parts, which is cool to see and encourage exploration, unlike the other new feature, which is bonus objectives. These are unknown until you beat the mission or beat the objective, and are often so absurdly tedious and arbitrary objectives like do this fast or go hunt down a certain amount of enemies. I personally didn't even do them all because I couldn't be bothered, since they felt like a Ubisoft collectible where it's just a way too annoying and not worth it to even care about. All of these missions can also be tackled in co-op, which is why enemies are so strong. 
they're actually tuned for more than one person. Now that we have mission structure down, let's take a look at the order missions first, as they are something a little bit more familiar. First, they are pretty short, boring, repetitive, and way too many. This game actually has the most in the franchise with 83 missions just in the order mission category, making this the game with the most missions. This is the only Armor Core game where I was so tired and bored of the missions that I didn't bother to S them all and even skipped one or two of them because I was so bored and burnt out of the game. There are also territory missions where you fight for, well, territory to gain team points, and they're really interesting and I kind of forgot it was a system. Which just leaves us with the wild part of Armor Core 5, the story and the missions in them. The missions notably are the longest in the franchise, often being as long as 20 minutes, when most HC missions tend to be 8 at max. These missions often felt absurdly long because of this, like Final Fantasy O Realm Reborn long. The length led to a change in which you are able to go to the garage in the mission in exchange for some cash, letting you rearm or even completely change your loadout. Given the enemy tuning for two people and you being able to re rearm, this is why enemies are so strong, and you will be here a lot, making each mission feel like a slog with how absolutely long they are. Now the gameplay changes are out of the way, let's get to that really weird first half of Gen 5 story I've been talking about, which is essential to understand Verdict Day's actually interesting plot and why this one stumbles in comparison. Bear with me here as this story is really something to say the least. Armor Core 5 takes place many years after 4 Answer, as mentioned, during the battle for Angel Gate City and the father's iron grip over it. Our story starts with us, the Dark Raven, trying to escape the city while we're working in the resistance with our partner Rosary, a migrant scavenger who used to be part of a mercenary group known as the Men of Honor, hawking out our services to the resistance who are, well, resisting against the father's order. We are then shot down by an unknown AC and are forced to fight him as the city is under would have laughed at the us. idea, but I guess I've changed. Getting money isn't everything. <laughs> Besides, it'd be more fun to tag along with you guys. Oh well, I was ready for a change anyway. did you miss? I believe I ordered you to take out the AC. They dodged. I guess Rosie still has a few tricks up her sleeve. But that won't save you in the end. We then start the game many years earlier where we are in fact working for the city police themselves. A way too heavily armed police force in fact. We are deployed to deal with the Resistance First Uprising, which is currently failing horrifically. We are ordered by original operator Carol to push them back and chase their leader, Jack Batty, a Blade Runner reference, into the underground, where our kill is actually stolen by a semi-interesting individual known as the Chief. You did a good job following me. Please accept my thanks. Are you watching, Father? This is just what you wanted. This time, however, Victory is ours. <laughs> I was watching you, rookie. Not half bad. Even if you did take your sweet time. I'd say you were perfectly suited to the job. The job of exterminating rats, that is. What happened? Run into trouble, Chief? Just a little delay. Rookie here wanted to enjoy the scenery. Nothing to worry about, sir. All right, then. Pull out. I'll read your report later. Yes, sir. Leader, come in. Heading for rendezvous. Escape separately, as instructed. We also hear Batty's daughter desperately calling out for him, wanting to know if he's alright. 
we then time uh, what? time skip what? again for what? some reason to many years in the future, where we are now working for the resistance with our operator Rosary and her partner RD, who's honestly abused by her and voice might sound familiar. That's what being a migrant is all about. You just have to take a chance and hope it pays off. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively end. obvious. But this conversation's between me and the boss. Small fry can butt out. Hogan is up! Hogan is up! No need to kick me. is up! For Fran, the daughter who now leads the resistance. I find this to be a really weird narrative choice personally, and I don't really get why they did it this way. It made me even feel like I got a weird version of the game, since it was so jarring just cutting back and forth in time so much. We worked them throughout the game on their campaign against the father and the city police, going from mission to mission in order to support the resistance in any way we can. Whether it's gathering supplies, clearing the city police, or escorting crafts. These missions are really just you supporting the cause and don't really stand out from a gameplay's point of view. The only thing they do give you is an absolute ton of character development through dialogue. The really weirdly written dialogue I was talking about earlier. While working for Fran alongside Rosary and RD, Rosary is always teasing Fran and egging her on, which feels like it would belong in an anime or more light-hearted game and not in this very heavy-handed war game where the stakes are as high as they seem to be. You knew what that was, didn't you, Rosary? Maybe, but your loyal servant told me to keep my mouth shut, so... That's why you didn't say anything? Who the hell does he think he is? I figured your star pilot was too good to bite the dust anyway. Having more info might have improved our chances. Wow, you really do give a damn. I'm touched. But that alone won't win wars. You're quite rude, you know. I get that a lot. It's almost time. So what's your plan, boss? We don't have any choice but to move in. If we see any enemies, take them out. Good answer. I knew you had it. Are you condescending? Rosary, what do you think? Nope, same as before. RD, get the route to the next facility. We're just wasting our time here. Hey, are you getting angry? You're cute when you're angry. RD, the next route. This isn't just a thing with them. There's this little bit with RD where she just straight up abuses the guy and belittles him for being a coward all the time, which is just kind of just way too mean for no good reason and gets honestly cringy at times. Especially since a lot of the times he's just straight up right, with this interesting set piece later in the game where we have to fight what looks like an arms fort. It's obviously trying to imply that he has high AMS capability when he bricks these things, which was what made AC pilots in 4 so deadly because of the higher compatibility, it said they can almost predict the future and have a sense of danger. And we keep putting this dude in awful situations too, like I said. Every time we get new enemies, he knows it's coming, and it usually is some kind of old piece of tech the unknown shatter group just known as the corporation has found and sicked on you. Many of these enemies they introduce in this style are also just really annoying with absurdly high damage or just a lot of health. They aren't bad, just annoying. Getting on track to the story, or what's left of it, we work more against the city and the corporation. We go down a train, where they do the weird anime thing of stating their mission statement and what they stand for when they go into combat. Sir, we've detected unidentified ACs in the tunnel. The terrorists, I presume. Eliminate all obstructions to law and order. This is the mission of the city police. Oh shit. Yes sir, they'll be taken care of. Searching for supplies where we meet the arms fort, then cross the ocean into the city so we can have a direct route to the city for the big attack. If this sounds like I'm skipping a lot of stuff, I'm honestly not. This game is genuinely this sparse in the story with a lot of events that just kind of yeah, happen, which isn't helped too much by not having any briefings. So the game just boils down to Rosary and Fran bitching at each other 24-7 while RD complaining every once in a while making the experience so sluggish as you just want to advance a story that doesn't really seem to be moving, but at the same time it is, you just aren't connected to it. They don't even build the father or the city police up that well because of this. You're told over time that the reason the resistance are rebelling is that all the people that aren't high up in society or privileged are forced underground and oppressed, except you don't actually get to see any of this or get enough time to sympathize with the cause. 
Instead, they throw the corporation with the Chief and Carol, who reappear again, right after RD literally dies out of nowhere, leading us to have to chase them and fight them in a sniper segment. We push forward with a final assault into the city after this, where the corporation ends up interrupting our plans when the resistance managed to capture the father, and they kill them and the father. RD also reveals himself to be a turncoat in this chapter who betrayed us for the corporation, who is looking to kill problematic pilots. So you came. Ambush? I finally figured it out, Rosie. How to win the game, I mean. I've been such a fool. I don't know why it took me so long. No. It can't be. If you want to win, somebody has to lose. Somebody else, that is. RD! This would have been a little more impactful if it wasn't spoiled in the beginning of the game of all things, and didn't have any impact when it happened, as I kind of understood why. Like yeah, if this girl abused me like she abuses RD, I probably would have left too. The corporation then destroys the city. We fight RD like three or four times before finally meeting him in a final boss fight, which was just the tutorial fight where Rosary gets downed and survives, and then the game just kind of ends on a boss fight that is admittedly really cool, but I literally just built a heavyweight tank where I basically just stood still the entire boss fight and still won. Honestly, a really shitty story that sounds as unconnected and lifeless as I described it. They want all these dark, depressing story plots with emotional moments and characters, but fail at actually building it up since there's not enough time or attention into the plot to actually make you want to care about what's happening since you have virtually no connection. Unlike For Answer, where saving our planet and the people on it is something everyone can understand, opposed to a revolution that you know nothing about. The corporation is also completely unexplained or given any backstory, making them a villain I was more confused about than anything else. Hell, one of the most important bits of information on them is in a garage, where it's in space, meaning the assault cells from For Answer had to be taken down and space colonies do exist. I'll be honest. I really didn't enjoy my time with Armor Core 5, and to this day, it's the only AC game I didn't go back to S rank every mission and just didn't care for the story. The story only served to be the background for the finale of the Armor Core 4 answer plotline and the best game of Generation 5, Verdict Day. Armor Core Verdict Day is the answer <laughs> to all the hate 5 received and decided to take everything the game had and tweak some stuff and rework some systems. First of all, the game essentially did the Destiny 2 treatment of making everything faster. The energy system isn't nearly as unforgiving and can be recharged much faster, even enabling you to boost forever with pretty simple build routes. They also added a ton of parts to the game to make it so you have more build variety onto the small AC5 list that there was, making way more options. I especially like how they added back weapon arms, which I think are some of the best renditions of them. I appreciate how you can still use your main hand weapons, but sacrifice the option of having things on your back so you could still use the arms giving you more weapons still. Granted, it's required since this game has no back weapons, but it's still nice to see. Weapon tuning is also back, but it's not multiplayer exclusive and can be used in single player, so you can actually have access to all of it. Most personally, I only ever crank the damage up for everything, and I do think it's probably the best option, as everything else I can see being good, but I just think having more damage is the better choice. Graphically, the game was improved more and looks better across the board, while somehow making the game feel far more responsive and smooth than last gen, and even the previous game 5. I personally think it's because there are less screen effects, but I'm not 
too sure. The multiplayer is actually still up this time and still is the main focus with really good feeling PvP fights that are actually fun with even fun co-op missions versus AI. And the best part is they tuned the game correctly in single player and not just for multiplayer so it isn't nightmarishly hard. And even if you don't have a friend, you can still get help from something called a UNAC. These are autonomous ACs that are fully customizable you can choose to take with you. There's actually even more depth to making these guys than your normal AC, with tuning them to fight better, choosing their voices, which sound really cool. And they take money from your pay to account for the repairs and fees. Mine was at one point even better than my own AC at times and carried me through some missions. Speaking of missions themselves, were kind of reworked to be much more enjoyable. First of all, story and order missions still exist, but this time order missions are directly related to the story, thank god, and are generally far more interesting because of that. And this time, the AC fights with the new systems are actually really fun, with each AC pilot feeling like they have a unique identity, with me often enjoying it so much I laughed out loud and read their bios, like this one guy who's, um, possessed by his emblem, which of course I gave to my eunuch. This new information that was actually done pretty well in terms of world building comes from the new feature called the Voice of War Network, which sends you information on enemy killed, history of factions, or update on the ongoing war from a news station's point of view. It is at the end of the day an exposition machine, but I liked it a lot and it reminded me a bit of getting emails and Mass Effect as you went along. And speaking of story, let's get into this one, because I actually really liked it and found going through the main game so much more enjoyable. So let's get to it. Verdict Day does yet another time skip, but this time it's 100 years after the events of Armor Core 5. Setting 4 and 4 answer almost 2-3 to three centuries ago, maybe even longer. In the current day, the contamination plaguing the planet has finally started to subside, with humanity across the globe reaching out to discover what the once barred areas have to offer, and what humanity found were giant towers spiraling into the sky with an unknown amount of hidden technology and power from a long forgotten age. Namely, the economic war. Three factions are now once again fighting over the control of these towers during the verdict war in order to gain as much power and influence as possible. Sirius Corporation, which was actually founded by Rosary after Armor Core 5, and seeks to bring the power to every single man and uplift all of humanity through order. The Evergreen family, who was founded by Fran and the remnants of the Resistance, who started to treat her like a god. And finally, Venid, a growing, almost empire-like state founded by a man known as Caesar. And now, where have Always I seen this story before? Kaiser. We are known simply as the lone mercenary along our elderly partner, Fat Man, who was a great pilot and is generally a great character. And the women he saved, Blue Magnolia. She's a young former Ace AC pilot who nearly died before Fat Man took her in, where she then became our operator. If she sounds really familiar to you, she's actually voiced by the same person who did Kasumi Tsukima, which is it's totally not foreshadowing. The game immediately starts with setting our crew up with their personalities on our first mission, with Magnolia being all business explaining our briefing, while Fat Man just sings what I can only assume is his version of Fortunate Son as he flies us in. It 
also serves to show us what role we'll have in this war. We are more traditionally and kind of refreshingly not actually connected to the war itself. We are just mercenaries here to make a big paycheck and we'll take missions from any faction since we don't actually care about the war or the politics. Just cold, hard dosh. Where things do get personal for us is with the people we see in the first mission who seem to be observing specifically us, judging our worth almost. Data acquired. What do you think? I don't know. Not much to speak of, but... We will eliminate anyone with potential. That is the plan, after all. I find this infinitely more interesting than AC5, where you were given a bunch of factions you're just supposed to care for, as opposed to here where we are more naturally introduced to them, their missions, and get a good amount of time with a more focused, smaller cast of characters. But moving along the plot, we work for the various factions, which for now is mainly attacking strike teams, sabotaging stuff, assassinating targets, which is our standard for the arena, or clearing bandits in the mountains where we get our first AC fight, which is where you can feel the difference in the gameplay of the new ACs. It's still relatively slow, but feels so much more better than now that both of you have more movement. These AC fights from time to time reminded me of traditional armor core fights and I really enjoyed them. It's also in these early missions where you can feel how these junk enemies you clear out have been clearly reworked. Most enemies are the same as 5, but have their values and their behaviors tweaked a little bit. For instance, some of these old snipers shoot like a shotgun now, and all enemies do much less damage making you able to take on far more enemies with the faster gameplay. It overall just feels so much more fair. For instance, I'm not nearly as afraid of these machine gun guys from the first game. They still hurt, but it's not immediately just a sigh of annoyance when I see them, knowing I'm gonna have to go back to the garage. It's absolutely solid work making the small cast of enemy forces feel good to fight, although I still don't like the rock paper scissor damage system. Moving along to our next major mission, we work for the Evergreen family to retake a city they lost so badly the enemy managed to take control of the entire city and all of their military equipment. I, I still don't get how they did it. Incompetence definitely becomes a major theme with all the factions in this game, which we always take advantage of like here where we threaten to leave if they don't pay us more. You were infiltrated and robbed of your weapons? <sighs> Talk about inept. called for minimal force to capture the enemy. We weren't expecting much combat. This is something completely different. You'll have to up the pay 50%. Payment directly after completion. Deal? How dare you extort the ETF? We're passing overhead now. Shall we keep going, Commander? I'll pay your price, but you will regret this one day. The mission in this chapter mostly boil down into AC fights and a mission where you team up with an ally. The only notable thing is this mission where we seem to be at the same highway back from For Answer, where we fight no count in the Orca squad. Our next mission has us working for Vanid to attack an Evergreen family squad, which quickly proves to be a setup by the family to kill us all, utilizing several Unax. Our first fight against them. They are really tanky and put out a decent amount of damage. Given their ACs, it's no surprise. But you can take into advantage of the fact they're AI since they have less advanced tactics and go down much easier. Unlucky for us, the numbers pose an issue. An issue in which a mysterious AC from that group that was observed us in the beginning wants to help us with, with her demanding we take them to her so she can shoot them down with our sniper. This unit of mine is equipped for sniper fire. Lure them into range. Take out the You can do this to get an easy mission, which is good since most of the stuff you have right now isn't built for this kind of combat, or attack her which causes her to be mad, or if you're a real gamer just, just kill them yourself. Either way you go, Magnolia wants to leave ASAP, breaking her normally stoic behavior, going into what looks like a panic because the person who came to help us is part of a group known as the Reaper Squad. We have no idea who they are or what they fight for. All we know is that they mean business. These guys. Running into them is why I quit mercenary work two years ago. There. The Reaper Squad. 
the group that took her out of action, as well as her arm. We aren't even given time to rest after this as our next job is from a mysterious client. A client that wants us to fight one of their experimental weapons for combat data. Survival isn't guaranteed, so they even offer a squad of Unax to help. Unax that get destroyed by this annoying bay wheel asshole. This is a T0605. Yeah, let's just stick to bay wheel. It has the okay guns that you can face tank for the most part, but can spin at you with a lunge that even has a heavyweight still kills you in two to three hits. So, you know, just don't get hit and it's not too bad. Bad advice, yes. Essential advice, also yes. Finishing our guy off, but the, wow, that sounded better in my head. Uh, we learned from the voice of war after we took pictures of it, the man is a leader of a group known as the Foundation, and the Bay Wheels is another one of its new weapons. The Foundation is a neutral organization in the Verdict War that develops advanced technology for the whole world from the towers that have been explored and sells to everyone. One such technology is the Unax, while the others we fight in some missions to mop up some of their tech. And it's the same equipment the corporation deployed for the War for Angel City. Now, given the towers are from the Four Answer era, it's likely the corporation is related in one way or another, but it's unconfirmed. The next missions are just mopping up more ACs and enemy forces. One AC fight even brings us back to the city from AC5, where we see the remnants of the equipment in the tunnels. After killing so many ACs and completing so many missions, we're starting to now show the world that we are very strong and a deadly force to be feared. Something Magnolia seems weirdly obsessed with. and something that Batman is increasingly concerned about. The next chapter begins with us being hired to help a serious corporation intelligence team extract, but they are downed in their helicopter immediately as we arrive, making it a hold the line situation. Which, after surviving for long enough and killing enough enemies, Sirius deploys a team of five Unax to assist us. Unax, which in the middle of the mission, turn on us, not by Sirius's orders. We have to kill every one of them while surviving this robo-evolution. We hear news that Unax all over the place are starting to act up and turn on their allies, and no one is quite sure why. I personally expected your Unax to turn on you at some point and avoided using them for a bit because of this. This doesn't happen, but it's kind of cool that it got me worried enough to not use them. Although, I do kind of wish something like that would happen, because it'd make the news of Unax rebelling much more real to you and make you feel like you're in this world. Our next missions are actually pretty basic, but very important from a world boiling point of view. Firstly, in our first AC battle, we were actually fighting in the ruins of the destroyed spirit of Mother Will. We destroyed way back in For Answer. It's really cool being able to see the ruins of this giant machine we personally destroyed still here hundreds of years later. I just wish, even though it probably wouldn't have made sense if we could find the Bernard and Felix sign that flew off in the cutscene. Our next sketchy job has us being required to defend a helicopter against waves of enemies, while well, it needs to power on so it can take off. Um, not to backseat pilot, but it's actually powered on already because it's left in the hover animations the whole time. So I was just thinking, like, it just go up? You're like, you're like halfway there already. It does take so long, probably because they wanted us to die, to a Reaper Squad AC who joins the ambush. Which makes Magnolia panic a bit before she orders us to just kill them. Which we do, to everyone's surprise. Hey, pilot! Wanna explain why takeoff was delayed? Like I said, engine trouble. Do you want your pay or not? I know you're hiding something. I don't know what you're trying to get at. The job is done. Good work. Man, I can't believe they took out a Reaper. That Merc's got some skills. The last two missions that follow in this chapter are just AC fights which aren't the interesting part. The interesting part is this environment. If you haven't noticed, these are the Cradles or at least what's left of them. A little context on the cradles from For Answer, but when they run out of power, they are designed to safely float down to prevent damage and death. But these are absolutely destroyed, looking like something or someone shot them down. I uh, wonder who would do such thing. Uh, definitely not something one of us would do, right? Jokes aside, this is obviously implying the true ending for For Answer is likely a combination of the Orca and Old King's endings. 
as it's the only thing that makes sense to me, with Strayed killing everything, especially the corpse since we don't have Kojima tech, which I highly doubt everyone would just agree to stop using since it's such an important power source as seen used in Silent Avalanche. The UNAC situation at this point is also getting far, far worse, to the point it's necessary to hire us to defend against an assault against a city. We even have this cocky guy to support. Ahead. We need to destroy any UNAX that break through these lines. You mean me and the Merc, right? You just sit back and let me show you the difference between man and machine. You're that mercenary Eric. I've heard of you. I look forward to seeing you in action. us to hold the line against a wave after wave of Unax, which can't end well. Until Reaper Squad of all the groups comes to our aid, with their commander themselves, Jay, leading them into battle. They seem to think we might be worth of selection, whatever that means. It's revealed after disabling every Unax that their leader, Jay, was the one who downed Magnolia all those years ago. Have you given up your blue AC for good, Magnolia Curtis? that seems to haunt her for the rest of this chapter. Something that's not helped that this chapter has the most AC fights out of all of them where we prove our worth. A fact that is increasingly make her compare herself to us, and that she's not actually sure if she was ever as good as we are now. An obvious obsession that Fat Man is getting more and more worried about, almost desperately for the woman he saved. Chapter 7 is where all of this comes to a climax, so to speak. The Foundation has revealed its true intention and plans. They are in fact responsible for the Unix going crazy and attacking everyone. They want to wage all-out war against all three factions, just for the sake of chaos and destruction. And Reaper Squad, they were just on their payroll, or at least partners in crime. For us, they send out yet another weapon. And in this case, it's a Beyblade. They have a really weird thing for spinny enemies in this generation now that I think about it. This guy, well, well spins, which blocks damage. Sends drones that are brutal on your health bar, and missiles to keep even more pressure on you. This is the fight where if you haven't figured out the build to fly forever, you really need to. Hint, it's a high output generator with a booster that has less than 8,000 consumption. Moving fast and striking hard with kinetic weapons is your only way to win this for you and your friends. One of which decides her time with us is over, as her true calling is here. You made it. Good work. She betrays, or leaves us, take your pick for the Reaper Squad and Foundation, so she can be a mercenary yet again. Something that Fat Man didn't want and is saddened by her decision. Just watching another young mercenary go down a path of destruction. Fat Man, the ever loyal one, doesn't leave us, instead becoming our operator for the rest of the game, as events get more and more tense as we fight in this spiraling conflict all across the world. But From Software decided the time for fun is over. And the time for PTSD is now. Chapter 8 begins with us being urgently requested to defend the city against the Foundation, only to realize it was base set by the Reaper Squad. I I've never seen anything like this in Armored Co- 
Uh, oh, oh no. Yeah, so this is you versus five ACs, all belonging to Reaper Squad. This gave me serious Occupier Geriaker Paul's PTSD at first, but luckily most of these guys are actually really, really weak. And the second wave is just an AC with two Unix as support. It's the last wave, which is at least thematically interesting. There's more coming. AC approaching fast. I don't think these guys are gonna let us get away. That's right, Fat Man. You're stuck with me a while longer. Let's get started. Magnolia joined the Reaper Squad as their newest M member, Im. She views dying on the battlefield as her destiny, and this is an inevitable end. Rather funnily, she's incredibly weak here, and I beat her with so little health, a swift breeze could have killed me. Unintentionally making this emotional battle really funny, even as the Reaper Squad leaves us an ominous threat and in question. This battle, the Foundation set up. Reaper Squad. They all lead to one goal. To find someone with your ability. To find you, and kill you. She was another who had potential. The power to destroy the current order. She was defeated. And yet she survived to fight once more. One destined to burn all to ash. The other with an enduring will to fight. I want to know which is real. And when I have my champion, I will kill them. I am the Reaper after all. Why does he sound like he's gonna cry? Oh no. After a bombshell like that, we are given a bit of a break for the chapter, just doing business as usual. There were the worst parts of this game here for me, but it's very nitpicky on one of them. Firstly, the mission has us to kill two autonomous weapons that aren't exactly that strong, but for me, one literally ran out of the map several times, making it really, really annoying. The other is they unfortunately made the French cannon an armored core, officially making this the worst game in the series. Zero out of ten. Go play the best from software game instead. Dark Souls 2. <laughs> Dark Souls 2. That's quite big. Impressive. All of our work has finally come to a head at this point, with the foundation being put on the ropes. They have very little forces left after we dealt with a large portion of Reaper Squad and many of their advanced weaponry. Our mission is to now go deal with what's left of the Reaper Squad, specifically Blue Magnolia and Jay. Upon arrival, she recalls us with a tale of her reasoning. Let me tell you a story about a time long ago when the world faced destruction. wanted to save mankind, and so he reached out to help. But there were some who did not accept God's offering. They intended to destroy the order that God sought to create for mankind. God was confused. Why did man not want to be saved? Some people just don't like being told what to do. Perhaps that is true. But God wanted to rescue mankind. So he decided to root out the dissidents and slay them. They say it was called the Dark Raven. A harbinger of death that left a trail of destruction. This is a true story. My ancestors saw it with their own eyes. They saw the coming of the first Dark Raven. Maggie, is that what? 
what you want to become? Perhaps. But more than that, I think... I just don't want to face defeat again. Not to anything or anyone. The Dark Raven was you from Armor Core 5. But it goes a little deeper than that if you once again refer to the Armor Core visual works. I'll say it again as well, that I don't like having required reading to understand the plot, but it gives context to the Dark Rage Raven's legend. Hari, who was cut from Armor Core for answer, had a whole plot line in that book, which when seeing you and the destruction you made, referred to you as the Dark Raven who would bring destruction making this legend be essentially ingrained in society and how it fell. Her fight is the same as last time till her health reaches zero, where she, like her real self, will lose her arm but continue to fight to the death. Something Fat Man laments as he never left anyone behind and tried to save anyone he could. And here, he can't do anything no matter how hard he tried. Something worth noting, however, is that no body was found on the wreckage in which no one could possibly survive, implying she may have in fact been turned into an AI but it's not quite confirmed. The Foundation man who considered her one of 52 candidates contacts us as well. He seeks a scavenger from Armor Core 5 at you, then challenges you personally through signs, meaning the Foundation has controlled the mercenary networks in all jobs we took the whole time. A challenge in which a familiar face shows itself with a familiar sound. Report your status, Jay. Knowledge and experience gained from walking countless battlefields, and now you are armed with combat data from the Unax. And on top of that, this craft will ensure your victory. You seek a world of endless war and destruction. On that, we can agree. It's not what I can live in. And so you abandoned mankind to destroy it? There is no place for me other than the battlefield to live as I please and die a senseless death. That is who I am, not a mere man of flesh. War is part of my existence. Bane system, activating combat mode. System, scan mode. There's that crazy old bastard. <sighs> Call me what you want. From my point of view, all of mankind is crazy. There are no exceptions. The Foundation has somehow managed re to reproduce a Nex from the economic war of 4 Answer with Jay as its pilot. This is NGWIX-V, a mouthful of a name for a Nex based on Line Arc's White Glint. However, it's actually based on a ton of parts from Ace pilots coming together, such as the chest being made of Omer's type Lahir, something that Ostrava preferred to use in stasis. The legs are allegedly based off the BFF-064, a part used by Lilium Molcott, and the Nine is a direct reference to the common use of Nine such as Nineball, or Anatolia's Mercenary, which was the rank he held in Armored Core 4. The next has the same capability as a White Glint from the Economic War as well. Primal Armor, Primal Armor Expansion, Assault Armor, Infinite Flight, Restored Weapons, and even uses an incredibly advanced over booster to get here. On top of that, during the whole fight, the song Mechanized Memories plays, a remix of Remember. Such a machine would require a real ace pilot to take advantage of it, something the Foundation attempted with Jay. Jay, as revealed, is a clone, a clone of Joshua O'Brien, the original White Glint. He even, like Joshua when arriving to the challenge, says there's no need for words, like when Joshua brought down Anatolia. WGNIX is also incredibly fast and hits incredibly hard. It doesn't help that Primal Armor will block all of its shots, 
and the Primal Armor expansion will one-shot you at close range or leave you with just a sliver of health. Fighting him actually benefits from using the same tactics and information on how to fight next and for answer. Rushing towards him to bait the Primal Armor will drain it completely, opening him up for kinetic damage which melts his health bar just like the original Nex. But in order to do this, you need to have something that can fly forever or be strong enough to just take the hit. This is actually the one fight where a lightweight build absolutely dominated. Doing this enough times will eventually bring him down, but just like the original White Glint, it restarts at full health. making it so you can trade attacks at all times. Though two caveats, Jay is acting far more aggressive when it comes to trading blows, making you have to play beyond your toes at all times. The second, as you can see, White Glint is leaking Kojima particles all over the place, constantly draining your health and putting this fight on a timer essentially, depending on how much damage you took from the first phase. But eventually, us and our tiny piece of junk managed to down the marvel of technology in front of us. The Foundation Man admitting he can't stop us informs us that even more weapons will activate upon his imminent death, starting the true war for the towers, a war which he believes will finally end a humanity that has no hope. That's where the story ends of Armor Core Verdict Day, with the world fighting back against now active machines of destruction from a long age past to end a humanity that may or may not have hope. It's probably already obvious, but I actually kind of love this boss and ending. I think thematically you going up against an AC and your piece of junk is just so cool, and I especially like how they built up this ending a fairly decent amount over the game opposed to 5 where it just kind of happens to people you don't really care about and are given a ton of missions to do after the main story to get the rest of the plot. Don't get me wrong, this game does do that here, but it's way better and not nearly as overt. It's also in multiplayer that extends it with the co-op stories I mentioned earlier against the weapon the Foundation Man mentioned with a few in particular to note. One is a restored spirit class arms for it, likely being the spirit of Mother Will itself. Another is Liv, which looks straight out of Punishing Grey Raven and is implied to be the operator of the Zodiacs from Armor Core 5. There is White Glint again and an upgraded form of Exusia from Armor Core 5 making a pretty cool roster of multiplayer targets and something I'd actually like to see again in an Armor Core game. Verdict Day, when you give it a chance, is actually one of my favorites in the franchise. 
even if it isn't perfect, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with this game and kind of regret not trying it earlier, unlike Armored Core 5, which I almost regret playing. So yeah, after thoroughly giving Generation 5 of Armored Core a chance, I can say I understand where this game went wrong and why so many people hate these games. But on the other hand, there's a lot to actually enjoy about them, and I actually do understand why you would like these, especially Verdict Day, which I still think is really good. And I know a lot of interest has been brought to Armor Core after 6, but for once, this is a series of games that, that I can genuinely say you probably shouldn't play, and I really liked Verdict Day. The game's design choices are just so far from what people would expect from the series with a lot of choices that just don't work, even in the new ecosystem they're in. I'd only say play these if you're a giant fan of for answer and armor core and want to see how the story ended up and how we got to the point we are today with the franchise. Especially since it's a bit of an adventure getting it to work on an emulator or finding a good used copy. Given these are one of the highest selling AC games, I think for to see this generation come back in any way, it, it has to be a remake since I just I don't think it's a fit for modern audiences at all and there's a lot of fundamental problems. That's about it. Thanks for coming to the end if you did. I'm not actually too confident in this video as it's the first time I actually really didn't like a game. So I hope this was written well as I really tried to get something together here. I actually did stream it all live here on YouTube as well, which was great. So come swing by sometime if you want to hang out or join our Discord server. Thanks again. I'll see you again when I check out the forgotten Hideo Bojima game, Zone of the Enders.